Okay, so now we're going to talk about size. How big is a measure? You know, in the previous world we live in, where measures were always non-negative, this was an easy um, question to answer. So you would say that, okay, mu of x, the full space, that's the size, right? But now if mu is a signed measure, uh, this can, might very well be zero, and still mu might have a very big positive part and a very big negative part. Okay. So let's say, okay, let's, we, we want to also, so to get back to this discussion about um, duality, I said that the measure space is um, the dual of the continuous functions. That's the Reese representation theory. Well, then we need some sort of norm. Yeah, so in order for the measures, the space of all measures to be a dual, it needs to be a Banach space. So we need a norm and a completeness and yada, yada. All of this we're going to do today. So if, if, if we have non-negative measures, I would just do this, okay? But if I have a signed measure, well, how about this definition? What? Without checking, knowing that this actually is a norm, so we need the triangle inequality, yada, yada. But this seems to be like a good definition of size but it doesn't really take us all the way uh, well at least actually this is what we're going to come up with in the end this is not the definition um, but what if we now we have a complex measure let's get back to those guys so first of all i told you i gave you a formula for complex measures you can write it as a sum of four different non-negative measures uh, let's let's see that we can do that now. So if mu is complex, then the real part of mu is then a signed measure, as well as the imaginary part of mu. And you know, for any complex number x plus i y, you can write it as you know. This is the real part plus i times the imaginary part. So then we get that mu is equal to, let's call it mu r, the real part, plus i times mu imaginary. And now what, what characterizes a measure is this infinite, you know, if you have a disjoint sequence of sets, then you have this infinite summation formula. So you take the real part of something which behaves like that in the complex plane, uh, you get something which behaves like that again, still, right? Um, so, so this is a signed measure, that's a signed measure. None of them take the value infinity. And then by the Jordan decomposition theory, now I have mu1 minus mu2 uh, plus i times mu3 minus mu4, okay? So then, then we get that formula. Nice. Generalizing now this idea, we would then say that for complex measures, mu, so the norm would be mu1, well, let me write like this, sum k goes from 1 to 4. But now I'm not agreeing any longer. This is not a nice definition. Why? Well, let's take this example here that we work with a lot. So if you have the mu is equal to f times the mu, well, let's say mu is now a, a, a non-negative measure. f is a complex valued integrable function. So then this becomes now a complex measure. In that case, I would say that you know, if I had this formula, this one, I would say that mu is equal to the integral of the real part of f plus the integral of the imaginary part of f times the mu. And that just doesn't look 
very nice does it i mean wouldn't it be better if this norm here that we're gonna introduce on v somehow was the same as the l1 norm So instead of doing the real and imaginary part of putting a modulus on those, we would like to just put the modulus on F and integrate against mu. And this is what we're going to achieve. It's just that then we need to depart from these very simple definitions here and go into something a bit more fishy, uh, not fishy, but uh, complicated. But also very rewarding because we're going to see that not only does it give us a norm, it gives us um, a, a, a bit like the same correspondence, right? So if you have a complex function, then you can take a modulus of your complex function and you get a function modulus f, which is non negative value uh, and it's strongly connected with him. We're going to do something similar with measures. So we're going to Take any complex valued measure mu, and I construct a new measure, which I'm going to call modulus mu, which is a measure in the traditional sense, which, which has exactly the same role here. Okay, so this is the plan. So first we're going to do construction of this measure. Then once we have that measure, I'm going to define the norm of mu as this. Yeah, so just like here, it's just that now I take the modulus on the measure. All right. And once I have that, okay, then I show that it's a norm. And then we see that the space of complex measures or sign, finite sign measures is um, it's a vector space. You can add them, you know, this is a norm. Um, so, so then we just lack like completeness to say that it's a Banach space. So that's at the end of the day, we're going to say that this is a Banach space. So beautiful stuff coming up ahead. So you know, let me not keep you in the dark any longer. How should we get a definition intrinsic that doesn't use the integral such that we get, we get this formula for measures defined like this? Well, think about it like this. Um, if this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, and then I have some function f, you know, on some space x. So for every point x, my f takes some value, right? And if this point moves around, then you know, the values are a bit everywhere. Um, So what we want to do is kind of want to split this up in sections and, and look at sets over here where, where, where f points in the same direction. Yeah. So let's say this is uh, section one, section two, section three of the complex plane, uh, just conical like this. And then I do some, okay, let me paint this like this is that now x is not the line, but something bigger. Then I can have a subset here, a1. This is the all x where the function values are here. Then I have a2. This is all x where the function values are there, and so on. What do we have then is, okay, so... So integral over my a k f d mu. Well, so let's say k is equal to two. So we are here now. All these values kind of point. Let's call this this angle here theta two, right? So there's a very little angular deviation here. So. What we're going to have is that this is approximately equal to e to the power of i theta k, just a complex number pointing in this direction. So here, times the corresponding integral, the modulus, right? 
This one will be a little bit smaller than this. So now if I put a modulus here on the outside, then this guy here disappears. And I have that this integral here with the modulus on the outside is almost the same as the one with the integral on the inside. And then of course, if I squeeze my sections here and make them smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, we're gonna get closer and closer to identity here. So guided by this, I'm now going to introduce the following definition. Okay, so the variation of a complex measure nu is equal to the supremum over nu a. Okay, I need a set here a, so I apply it to some set a, and then here I do a k. So these are not necessarily those a k's over there, but well, it is. If, if this guy a here is x, then the a k's. All right, where were I? Okay, so we do this, um, and we consider all finite. Wait. Right, so the measure, the, the well, not, well, modulus nu, which we don't know yet is a measure, it is a measure, but we haven't proven it, applied to some set A is the supremum of the sum of the modulus now outside. Big difference here, modulus inside, modulus outside. So here we just take the modulus of a complex number all the time, right? And we consider all sets a k all, all decompositions of the set a into finite pieces finite amount of pieces so disjoint and you just you just sum up so it's pretty at least intuitively clear if you think about this picture that that for measures that arise uh, by integrating a function f we're going to get this formula here and for measures that don't arise like that okay here's a it's a definition Okay, so and here I don't really like the books where proposition 417 and 418 um, and also those lemmas in the beginning of 4.1. To me, the setup is a bit confusing. So what I have against the lemmas in the beginning is that by now with the Jordan decomposition theory, when we have um, this, the, the, the content of the lemmas 41, whatever, 2 and 3, it just follows from one to six and one to five, the corresponding facts for you know each of these guys by themselves. Um, that's one thing. And then they have also this statement that, so if you have, for example, an infinite intersection of decreasing sets, if you can do your limit thing there, so infinite intersection on the inside of the measure, you can pull it out and get a limit. Um, that's equivalent with being a measure if you have um, like the, the, the countable additivity follows from that if you have established finite additivity, but it all gets a bit confusing. I, I prefer to just prove the formulas countable additivity directly on this guy, for example, right? So I'm taking a different path here. Uh, either it's up to you which one you want to follow. So. Okay, so this is the proposition I want to prove now. It is basically uh, 417, a bit of 418, and then the last statement about that integral formula is actually proven up here, that's 425 for some reason. I think these facts fit together. So this is uh, right, 
my proposition proof. So here I just write a small reminder of the definition of the key part. So you have to keep in mind that the A case are disjoint and Q union is A and all of that. So the first thing we want to show Right. The first thing we want to show is that we have additivity of two sets. If we can do it for two, then you, by finite induction, you get it for any finite sequence of sets that are mutually disjoint. So let's prove this. And let's note that it's obvious that if A is a subset of B, by just looking at this definition, then U of A in modulus is less than or equal to this. Um, so that we have, I think it's just written here. I don't know. I, I guess we need it at some point. Yeah, so this this is not difficult at all, actually. So what here's my A, here's my B. What's the measure of this guy? Well, you have to, you know. Decompose it into well, C1, C2, C3, and so on. You have to make a, a finite bunch of guys. Now I'm calling them C because well, let's, let's think of the union as the set C. So these are and take the roles of these guys. So you have a finite amount, amount of those. Some of them will end up in A. I mean, you have to split them up. Each C1 has a piece in A and a piece in B, and then you play with that. And you get one inequality, and then you. Um, you, you, you do the to get the reverse inequality, you, you just flip the argument around. Uh, let me do the details, anyways. So, uh, given epsilon bigger than zero, understood the C case are disjoint. They are subsets of A union B. And okay, so the modulus here of A union B is the supremum of all such sums. So if I subtract a bit of an epsilon, um, I can get a concrete partition so that I'm bigger than this guy minus the epsilon. All right. And now here I have the modulus on the outside, so now I can just use all of the formulas I know. I mean, U is a measure, right? So then um, this is equal to some k go from one to big K. So here I use that A and B are disjoint, just finite additivity of the measure. And then, of course, I can go in with the norms here, turning this into an inequality. And now this is a finite partitioning of disjoint sets of A, same here with B. So again, by the corresponding definition for those guys, this is less than or equal to U of plus norm u of b, right? Good. And as I said, uh, to prove the reverse inequality, we just flip the argument around. So now instead of c1, c2, and c3, I'm going to do close these guys. There's a1, a2, a3, and then you have b1, b2, b3. Of course, they don't need to lie next to each other. I mean, there's something like next to each other. But yeah, you get the point. So what we have now is mu of A minus epsilon um, 
less than or equal to sum k goes from one to k mu of a k. Okay, so we can do this. And uh, maybe I need a different k here and a different k there, but then I can just fill up here with, with void sets. So we, we can assume that that is the same k. Um, and now I do this one plus that one. I get this sum plus that sum. You know, this, God damn it. this one plus this one will be less than or equal to this sum plus this sum. And now these together, C is a union. Uh, the, the, the finite union here makes up A union B, right? So at the end of the day, this sum plus that sum qualifies as an example like this for here A union B. So I just write dot dot dot, and then we see that mu of A. Modulus mu of a modulus mu of b minus two epsilon is less than or equal to modulus mu of a b, right? Um, okay, and maybe I even forgot to say that up here, but of course now epsilon is arbitrary, so we see that this is really less than that. We can throw this guy away, and then yeah, same thing here, right? So this one. The end of the day. Okay, so then modulus nu is additive, and then finitely additive by just a simple induction argument. Okay, so now let's go for the countable additivity. And here, here we need help. We need to introduce a new guy so that we can keep uh, controlling the size of tails, right? So you have this. Now, now we have a definition, modulus nu, that, okay, so, so the Jordan decomposition theory gives us this, right? Like the same for nu. So now when I define nu of A as the supremum here, modulus this, this is just a complex number. So of course, uh, you know, for each A K, this is less than you know new one a k plus new two a k plus new three plus new four a k right and then uh, these are all measures so you use just the finite activity of these guys and you see that here you get new one of a when you throw the sum there as well so. It's very easy to see that, and then we can just take away this A here. So mu one plus mu two plus mu three plus mu four. So we don't know that he's a measure. We know that this is a measure and it's bigger. And that, um, yeah, that's going to help us. So, so let's give this guy a name. Let me call him phi instead. Okay. So what do we have? Um, we take new backboard. So now we have a one dot 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 a two dot 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 disjoint, and we want to prove the infinite summation formula. So sum goes from one to infinity modulus new a k. We want to say that this is the same as modulus nu, and then inside we have the infinite union. Well, what does it mean to have an infinite sum? It means to take the limit of a finite sum. But now we just agreed that these guys are finitely additive at least. So this is limit. Right now we need this, what I said in the beginning, that if you take a bigger set, 
the modulus nu also becomes bigger. So this guy, if you forget about the limit for now, we have that I can do here the infinite union, right? That's true for every big K. But now this is a number that doesn't depend on K, so it just puts a lid on this. If I do the limit, it's still going to be less than that. So that's one direction. The converse direction is a bit more tricky. That's where we need this phi. Um, Phi is a finite measure, so this is a finite number. Here we can go in and do the infinite union, right? This means that I can pick some large number n in the, the tail here, so that this sum is less than epsilon. But now we agree that phi is bigger than modulus nu, so I get here that Get that this is also less than epsilon. Of course, as usual, epsilon is some fixed arbitrary number that I had, should have specified to begin with. Okay, and from here on, it's not that hard. So now, what do we have? We here we have him on the right hand side. So now I start with him on the left hand side. So new of infinite union a k. Well. Using the finite additivity, I can do here a you know, finite union of the AKs. I don't know why this is a big N and not a big K, but anyway, it's the way it is. Right? K equals to yada yada. I don't know. simplified notation like that. Finite additivity on this part, and this guy is less than epsilon. Actually, that's not what I have here, but that's that's fine because all right. So this is less than epsilon means I can put the infinite union inside, and it's less than epsilon. And then I use the fact that he dominates him to say that this with the infinite union inside is less than epsilon. Okay, so then I have that. This guy is less than epsilon. Here I have finite additivity, so this is less than or equal to um, some k goes from one to big N mod nu a k plus epsilon. Of course, so now I take a limit as a big N goes to infinity, and then I'm done. So this guy less than or equal to infinite sum, yada yada plus epsilon. And now this is just a fixed number, and epsilon was arbitrary, so I can throw him away. Um, yeah. So new modulus new is a measure. Crime. So we're still not done with the theorem. We need to prove that. Um, that the following definition gives us a norm. And I read here in my paper, this is trivial. I love these proofs. It's trivial. Okay, let's move on. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, why is that trivial now? Um, it probably is. So what we need is if, if we have two measures now, nu and well, nu one and nu two, then this is modulus nu one plus modulus nu two applied to x. And by the definition, which now has gone up, all right, 
it's very easy to see that this is less than or equal to new one plus well applied to x plus modulus new two applied to x right why is that because um so i just take some finite partitioning here for new one plus new two and add this here's written new one plus new two inside and then this modulus is just uh just trying with equality on that and um, yeah okay good so now the set before this whole course we've been working with a measure mu is a measure given now we can start to think of the set of all signed measures or, or either finite sign or complex as a vector space you know we can add them subtract them we couldn't do this before because the measures had to be non-negative and then you know if you take the difference of two you lost non-negativity but now we can do this so we start to think of this as a vector space and on top of it we have gotten ourselves a norm here so very nice development okay and then finally why do we have this integral formula well basically i outlined the proof already so this is the complex plane let's look at an opening here uh this angle is theta i think before my theta was a bit different but now theta so this is symmetric right so I have plus theta and minus theta um so this is going to be my s1 and then here i have an s2 and so on um then here's my big space x and now here's a1 will be the set of points such that my function f sends into here right and then a2 is going to be those like yeah all right get the point i hope now if you just look at Right, so now the new is equal to f times the new, right? And when I do my modulus new, I have to look at the definition. So this is going to lead me to looking at things like new of a1, a2, a3, and so on. And I choose my partitioning like this. So, okay, let's just look at new of a1. Now, this is a complex number which is the integral of f characteristic function a1 the mu all right and now of course if a modulus goes on the inside i get a bigger number and then I do that for a2 and a3 and so on, and no matter how I define my a1s. So it's very easy to see. Um, it's very easy to see like that, that norm of mu is less than or equal to the integral modulus f. The mu, the difficulty is proving the reverse one. Okay, so then if we look at the size, the point is that now all these values where f is not zero they point in the same direction so if you think about it um let's say some value is here right then the, the corresponding value down on the x-axis which is the real part uh, they're not going to be that very different right so in fact what we get is for, for an x in here, sort of the f of x here, we have that. Um, sorry, this one goes the other way around. Yes, right? So now I put my modulus f of x here, I divide by cosine of theta. Cosine of theta, you know, when this is small, this will be almost one. That's the whole punchline here. So, Here's the modulus of a complex number. We're reusing this trick from 2.6 that I've already used. So, so this is a bit hard, right? Because taking the modulus of a complex number is a nonlinear thing we do. That is square root and yada yada. But we know that this is a bigger than or equal to the real part of the corresponding integral. Okay, that's what we want. 
Yeah, and then I move the real part inside, so I just get the real part of the function. And now I use that the real part is bigger than we the cosine theta times the modulus. Okay, um, then I get a cosine theta out here, and then modulus f on the inside, and that's where I wanted to go. Right, and now the inequality goes the correct way. Now, of course, for uh, you know, here's an A2, and then you have some sort of cone here of opening two theta. But um, you know, when we're just rotating a bit, you see that the same um, so, so when you do your U of A2 here, what you need to do is here do e to the minus i two theta. So you just rotate everything so that this line here in the middle ends up on the real line. Repeat your trick, and then you see that this is true for all thetas. So, sorry, for, yeah, for all a1, a2, a3, and so on, for all, all openings, yeah? And then you go the whole circle around, and you see that, okay, so modulus mu of x, well, uh, even the subset A, then this is, of course, less than. So now, if the union of the A case becomes my A, then I have this. This should be a finite sum. And then here I have my cosine theta integral mod f, oh, and the a1 disappeared here. So a k, the mu, and now what happened to my sum? The sum is also here. The point is, at the end of the day, we just get cosine theta. This is very messy. Uh, I'm sorry, keep on writing here. Cosine theta integral more than the mu, man, this is a shitty use of blackboard space. But anyway, this inequality now goes the right way. So I have this bigger than or equal to this with this cosine of theta here. But of course, theta was arbitrary, so I can make it how close to one, one I want. And then we get the inequality going the other way. Whew. Okay, so now let's m of x sigma algebra a mu, and here you can put r or c to denote uh, whether it's a finite sign, then it's r or complex, and you put c. Measure, this is a, a set. Of course, we can add measures to the practice and so on, so it's, it's not only a set, it's a vector of space. And now we have the total variation norm, as it's called. So it's a norm vector space. So it saves the property of completeness uh, that it's a Banach space. And that is also true. So theory. Yes, it saves space. And again, uh, the proof here in the book goes a bit of a different way. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make a very basic proof here. Using a bit of the, um, I'm going to use Tonelli and Fubini's theory for sequences, for doubling the sequences. But this is supposed to kind of um, know from before. Otherwise, of course, yeah, it relies on chapter five, which we did already in this course. Anyways, so here's one way to do the proof. There's another way of doing the proof in the book. All right, so relying on proposition, yeah, 325. So remember, we did this already once when we proved that LP spaces were complete. Instead of starting with a Cauchy sequence and proving that that has a limit, which is sometimes hard because, yeah, uh, it's sometimes much more concrete to work with um, an infinite sum of objects. So we assume some UKs exist, they are in here. 
so this somehow replaces like these finite sums here replaces the Cauchy sequence. And then you want to prove that if you um, take the limit to infinity, then in a sense, this defines a measure mu, which is in here. Um, and, and that you have this. So under the assumption that the infinite sum of norms is finite, right? So if we can establish this, then completeness follows. So this could have been an exercise before or whatever. But first thing to establish is actually that, I mean, we have to show that mu is a measure, okay? So we're gonna set just from T, J, K, be equal to mu uh, K of A, J. Okay, what's A, J here? So we want to prove that mu of the infinite union, J goes from one to infinity, A, J is equal to infinite sum, J goes from one to infinity, mu, K for mu of AJ, right? So AJ is just from a uh, bunch of these things, this joint sets. Okay, so we want to prove this. And mu in itself is also an infinite sum. So here on this side, we get a sort of double infinite sum. And if you remember that infinite summation is, is just integrating against the counting measure, then you realize that, okay, if I have a double sum here with now one summation inside and then the other one outside, it's just like what we have in Fubini's theorem, right? So then the question here is, can I flip the order? Well, Fubini's theorem tells you that you can do that under certain conditions. So um, basically, okay, so let's let's do this. So mu infinite union j a j is equal to so now I do my infinite sum here in k. And now each one of these guys is a measure. So now our infinite sum in K, infinite sum in J, mu K A J. So that's my T J case, right? Okay. When am I allowed to flip order? Well, by Fubini's theorem, we have to show that this is an um, L1 function in the product measure space, with the product here being um, the natural numbers times the natural numbers and counting measure times counting measure. So Tonelli's theorem is what you then use. You wanna put modulus here and see that you get a finite sum. Um, so infinite sum J, infinite sum K, uh, moduli here. And then we have to figure out which way is best to do this. So it turns out that we do it like this. In Tonelli, it doesn't matter. If one of these option, uh, alternatives is finite, then you're good to go, right? So if I now sum up in J, what do I have here? Well, this looks kind of like the definition actually of variation. Okay, I have an infinite sum here, but it's very easy to see. And also for infinite sums, an object like this is less than or equal to just the norm of mu k. And then here we have this sum now that we know that this is finite, so this is finite. So then Tonelli slash Fubini joined together tells us that we can flip the order here. And now what do we get? Now we have the sum on the inside. So let me put back here sum j, sum u, k, a, j. Okay, but now this is just the definition. So this is sum j, u of a, j, right? Definition of u. 
Um, yeah, so then we see that the infinite sum of the new J's is a measure. Now, finally, we need to also push through this, but that is uh, the easier part. So, if I now have a finite sum of AJs that split my space X, then I have to look at U minus sum K goes from one to some B K, U K applied to some AJ. Basically, just looking at how we define mu as the limit, I put the norm here. This is less than we got the infinite sum from k plus one to infinity, and now the norm comes on the inside, right? So this is less than we got the infinite sum. And here I can put now the the variation, right? Now we do a sum over this over J. So then I get a sum here over these guys over J, and then a flip order when I have a finite sum, you know, like this. You can always flip the order with the infinite sum. Finite no, maybe we need to use this guy one more time. But anyway, so in this situation, I'm allowed to flip order and so here I have an infinite sum from k plus one to infinity, and then my new k mod a j. But now I place order. Let me just do that like this. If j comes here, k plus one is here. I have infinity. I have one. So now this is less than here. Each one of these is less than the norm of UK, right? So now we're back to that. This is a finite sum. So if just big K is big enough, this can be less than whatever epsilon. So that's the end of 4.1. So yeah, let's do a break here.